uh, why don't we get started? <clears throat> so where we last, oh yes, uh, so as you all know, there is an assignment due uh, on the 30th, which is, um, what's today, 20th, two days from now, uh, so on Thursday at the usual uh, one second uh, before midnight. Uh, I look forward to uh, your creative solutions. Okay. Any questions about it? No? All right. <clears throat> so where we last left off, uh, we talked about uh, these tests, uh, as they were, uh, and these tests determine uh, the quote-unquote quality, as we had uh, discussed later, but more so just mentioned that name at a high level. But nonetheless, these tests um, evaluate the quality of your estimator. And recall, we have an estimator, uh, theta hat, and that is calculated or computed uh, uh, based on a statistic, some function over the data. And we hoped uh, that this estimator would be a good replacement uh, for the ground truth parameter theta. And the challenge was uh, that theta uh, that governs the values that you see when you measure things from a population through sampling. Uh, theta, ground truth, governs it, but theta is not accessible to you. Theta is hidden from you. And so uh, this test of biasness, uh, we applied that uh, to um, x bar, which is the sample mean, and we showed that it does mathematically uh, give you uh, mu, which is the population mean. And we tested that in MATLAB, and we produced some number of trials, uh, uh, samples from a fictitious population that we created, and that population remains fixed, and we showed that if we took uh, the average, which is kind of like computing the expectation of this uh, a sample mean, uh, that it was really, really close to the ground truth population parameter. Uh, so in that example, I actually showed you what that population mean was, uh, but in reality, in the real world, uh, you don't have access to it. You don't know what it is. Okay? All right. Any questions about that? Okay, so to draw your memories. So let's continue on. And the next test uh, is called the consistency test. And it says, and this is in the book, an estimator um, uh, theta hat uh, for some parameter theta is so-called consistent if the probability of sampling error converges to zero in the limit as your sample size tends to infinity. Uh, so what does that mean? That means uh, you have your uh, ground truth parameter theta, which you don't really know, uh, and you have your statistic theta hat, your estimator that you hope will be a good replacement for theta. And so in this expression, we have a probability, and it says the probability that your estimator theta hat will differ from your ground truth unknown parameter theta by more than some error tolerance epsilon, right? And so here we have absolute value uh, because we don't care about whether or not this difference is positive or negative. We care about the magnitude. So the likelihood that you're going to be far away, you being uh, the person that calculates the statistic theta hat, uh, the likelihood that that uh, estimator is going to be far off or far away or very different uh, from theta, uh, the ground truth unknown, uh, is going to go to zero as a consequence of increasing your sample size. Okay? All right. And so as you increase the sample size, the estimator is less likely to differ uh, from your population parameter. And I'll show an example of that um, in MATLAB. In fact, I'll bring back up uh, the previous example. Okay. And so Let's take a look at what happens to the variance or the dispersion uh, of this sample mean, right? And so we're going to kind of show this mathematically, and then we're going to prove this in, uh, or validate this empirically, uh, empirically meaning from the data through uh, an example. And so we have our X bar, our sample mean, and if we were to compute the variance of it, and we saw that uh, in that graph we had from last time with the sample mean. Uh, so the variance of x-bar, well, we uh, substitute uh, for the definition of x-bar, which is the sum of the first sample plus the second sample, dot, 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 up to and including the nth sample, so our sample size is little n. Uh, and so the variance of this x1 plus x2, dot, 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 plus xn over n, uh, we substitute in that step uh, the definition of what x-bar sample mean is. So then using some properties from last semester, linearity of uh, variance, it says that two things. Uh, if you multiply a variable, random variable, by a scalar and take the variance of that uh, uh, result, uh, so you have a bunch of measurements, multiply measurement by a scalar, the variance of that resulting scalar times uh, the random variable, uh, that scalar squares, 
right? And if you think about what variance means, remember the variance uh, has a squared term. You have a parenthesized expression that says uh, the variable minus its mean quantity squared, right? And so if we have some scalar times a variable minus uh, the mean or expectation of the scalar times that variable, that squaring uh, for that parenthesized expression is where that squaring of the constant uh, in this case comes from. And so we bring out that constant in the denominator, 1 upon n, and that gives us 1 over n squared. And that leaves us with that sum, x1 plus x2 plus x3 dot 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 plus xn, the nth measurement, uh, in the numerator. And then the other property for variance that we'll apply here, we talked about last semester, it says the variance of the sum of a set of measurements is the same as the sums of the variance. And so if we had a variance of x1 plus x2 plus x3 dot 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 plus xn, uh, that plays out the second step here, second line, as the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2 and so forth. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So now, of course, if the variance of a random variable uh, is sigma squared, right, that means we have n many of these sigma squares in the numerator substituting sigma squared for each instance of variance of x1 plus variance of x2 and so forth. And this gives us n many of these sigma squared uh, in the numerator. So we have n times sigma squared. Now, of course, we have uh, our um, uh, n sigma squared. In the, uh, we have a copy of n in the numerator, and we have an n squared in the denominator. One copy of each n uh, cancels, and we're left uh, with uh, sigma squared over n. Now, of course, if n increases, what happens to this expression? Sigma squared is a constant. That doesn't change as you increase sample size. But as you increase sample size, that denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the resultant effect uh, is that this variance uh, is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what does that mean? What that means is, is that your estimator, in this case, theta hat is x bar, right? It's going to change less and less over time uh, as you increase the sample size, right? So that's sort of getting to a, getting us to uh, this consistency proof. So if this theta hat varies less and less and less, that means from one trial uh, of measuring it to the next, it's going to change less and less and less. And therefore, it's not going to diverge very much uh, from the unknown ground truth parameter theta. Any questions about this? Okay. So, Let's recall uh, Chebyshev's inequality, and we're going to take another uh, uh, tact uh, at trying to understand what consistency means. Now, Chebyshev's uh, inequality from last semester, uh, we mentioned it, and we talked a little bit about it. Uh, it sets a bound on a probability. And what does that bound mean? It says that the probability of some occurrence, right, some event, in this case, the event is that some variable or measurement x will diverge from its expectation by more than some error tolerance uh, epsilon. And it says that probability is less than or equal to uh, sigma over epsilon quantity squared. Or you could say sigma squared over epsilon squared, uh, same difference. Uh, and what that less than equal to connotes is how bad can it get? How often will the occurrence of what's inside this expression in the curly braces, that bad event, how often will this bad event occur, right? So on the upper bound, right, that less than equal to, it says this is how bad it can get. This is how often this undesirable event uh, can happen, where that undesirable event is the likelihood that your measurement differs from this unknown ground truth uh, by more than some error tolerance. Uh, so really, Chebyshev's inequality was a tool uh, that we use to determine or connote this idea of how bad can things get, how often, what proportion of the time when you do something, will you see something that's undesirable occur, okay? Uh, so it's assumed that you have a defined expectation and you define variance, and then this tolerance epsilon is greater than zero, okay? Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So if we take Chebyshev's inequality, and our measurement, instead of an x, we're going to substitute our estimator theta, right? So everywhere you see uh, x in Chebyshev's inequality, you're going to substitute x bar. And you can apply Chebyshev's inequality uh, to any uh, statistic, right? Or any measurement, conversely, because a statistic is nothing more than a function over measurements. It's a type of fancy measurement. Uh, you could consider it. So 
Substituting, well, what does that mean? We said the Chubb-Jacobs inequality says the likelihood that a measurement is going to diverge uh, from its expectation by more than some error tolerance epsilon is going to be no worse than or at most uh, variance over uh, epsilon quality squared, right? So in that case, then, we substitute for x, our x bar, that's our theta hat, and then the expectation of x bar is mu, right? We already proved that uh, from before when we talked about uh, our biasness or unbiasedness test. Uh, so we have x bar, probability of x bar, uh, diverges uh, from mu by more than some error tolerance epsilon is no more than or less than equal to the variance of that statistic, the variance of x bar over epsilon squared for some setting of epsilon. So certainly, you know, you could decide you want to have a very tight error tolerance, like 0.00001, or you could have a more generous error tolerance, like 0.5. But nonetheless, uh, this probability uh, can be no worse than or uh, no bigger than or less than equal to the variance of our statistic x bar over epsilon squared. Now, from before, we just got done calculating the variance of x bar, our uh, sample statistic, our estimator, x hat, uh, x bar rather. Uh, so we substitute in the variance of x bar, which is sigma squared upon n in the numerator. And then we have our epsilon squared in the denominator. And we take the limit as n, the sample size, uh, goes to infinity. So what does this say? Well, if n goes to infinity here, we have sigma squared over n in the numerator. Well, that n is in the denominator of that term uh, in the numerator, right? Uh, you could also rewrite this as sigma squared uh, over n times epsilon squared, where n epsilon squared is in the denominator. But nonetheless, if we make n bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the top half of this expression goes to zero. And what does that mean? It says, as you increase the sample size n, the probability that your x bar will be different from your mu, right, the ground truth uh, hidden parameter, is going to be zero. So that means if you make it big enough, it will never diverge. Okay? Uh, so that says if you want a pretty good guarantee that your x bar is going to adequately and suitably reflect uh, the unknown uh, parameter mu, uh, the mean for some population under consideration, you're guaranteed that it will very rarely differ or never differ as long as you make the sample size big enough. Now, I stress this idea and use the term big enough because based on the amount of computation that you can afford right, on your platform, uh, you might not be able to make n really, really big. So what do you do in practice? Well, you try sample size of maybe 100. And then you try a sample size of maybe 150. And you increase your sample size in regular increments. And one of the things you'll notice is how this uh, limit, how it proceeds over time as you increase your sample size. And why do you care about that? Because you might find that, let's say, you had some problem and you wanted to know what uh, this ground truth population parameter is or you want a good substitute for it. You run a simulation like we had gone over in class uh, last week, Thursday. And then you notice that the error or the difference, um, maybe that difference goes down by 50% when you go from a sample size of 100 to a sample size of 150. And then maybe when you go from 150 to 200, it goes down another 20%. And then you know, increase it another 50, and it goes down another 10%. You increase another 50, and it goes down 5%. What you'll find is that the rate of decrease in this sampling error is going to change, right, it's, uh, uh, based on the sample size. So you'll find in practice, if you're limited in the amount of computation that you have available for some problem, uh, you test out in the simulation uh, the convergence of the sample, the sampling error, and then you decide, okay, is 5% off good enough for me? Is 10% off good enough for me um, for uh, my platform? Because, I mean, for your application, because at the end of the day, it's the practical engineering consideration of how much computation you have available. And when I say afford computation, I don't mean, oh, well, the computer is going to cost too much. Uh, there are some applications, for example, uh, let's say you know, you're estimating uh, somebody's uh, average heart rate. Right? So the heart rate naturally changes over time, and you don't know what ground truth the average heart rate is, the mean. 
right? And so what do you do? Maybe you have a watch platform or maybe you have some embedded device in an article of clothing that someone is wearing, right? Well, when you're taking these samples, uh, the embedded platform only has so much storage and only has so many MIPS uh, to go around, millions of instructions per second unit of computational strength. Um, and so in that case, you're limited not necessarily by cost, but by practical consideration because you don't want to add something the size of a laptop in an article of clothing that's not practical for someone to carry around uh, on their person, right? And so when I say afford computation, I mean the engineering definition of afford, meaning that not just the cost, but also things like reliability, as well as the practical limitations or constraints you have for the problem at hand, okay? All right, any questions about this? Make sense? So here we have a direct application of Tebyshev's inequality, something that we uh, talked about just a little bit last semester. And this is a general tool that you can use uh, to measure this notion of how bad can it get. And this is an exact uh, or precise uh, demonstration of what consistency is getting after. It's an application of Tebyshev's. Okay? All right. So let's try this out in MATLAB. Uh, so I'm going to pop out of here. And we're going to look at the variance of the sample mean uh, over time. Okay. Uh, so let me exit this and show. And so uh, I'll bring up MATLAB. Hopefully the license server cooperates. And I'll start with uh, the example that we had from last time. And I'll modify that. Maybe I'll save it under a different name and then post that uh, as a second. There we go. All right. So it was called Test Sample Mean 2020. Uh, so let's save this under a different name. Uh, let's call it test sample mean means, because you can't have apostrophes in MATLAB file names, uh, variance, right? So we're testing uh, how the sample means variance differs uh, from the variance of the true mean uh, uh, for the original population. So to draw your memory of uh, where we left off, let me just run the unadulterated uh, MATLAB file um, and uh, show you where we left off. Let me just do a little bit of bookkeeping. Add to path. And again, I'm hearing Tansy. Let's see. It's almost like this is your conscience speaking. I hope my conscience doesn't sound like Tansy, but that's another conversation. All right, there we go. So let's run this. Okay, uh, let me um, let me simplify things a little bit. So let's uh, go back to say 200 trials, and let's put the sample size uh, at 10. And so 200 many times we're going to sample uh, from this population of ages, and we had this population of size 100,000, and um, this population uh, cons uh, is, consists of a bunch of people uh, and the measurement uh, from this, uh, members of this population uh, is the age. And so we simulated that uh, by taking the age range from zero, uh, you could think, consider that as being newborn, uh, up through age 110. And so we use this RNG uh, to set the random seed, random number seed, so that our population of ages um, was the same every single time because we want to have reproducibility uh, for this experiment. And so we computed uh, mu, the mean, this is the population mean, and again, um, I'm showing it to you, but you can imagine uh, the mean exists, but you don't get to see what it is, and that's what happens in real life, right? And the example that we had carried forward over the last few modules was uh, the homeless population uh, for Dover. You don't really know uh, what the average age is, for example, the homeless population in Dover, because you will never identify all of them. And so we set the sample size to 10, so we're going to collect uh, 10 ages uh, from individuals in this population, uh, and then we're going to compute the sample mean, and we'll keep doing that uh, num trials many times, so we're going to do it 200 times, and we plot the sample mean, right, which is going to change because we're sampling, uh, and we plot that against uh, the population mean, which stays the same, okay? All right, so let's run this, and uh, if we look at this, let me increase this, and of course I set the axes uh, to be uh, the same uh, because MATLAB, uh, trying to be helpful, uh, will uh, readjust the scale uh, 
uh, on your figures to try to make the plot as large as possible. But very often, if you're trying to make comparative evaluations uh, from one instance of something to the next, you don't want it to resize the axes. You want to fix the axes. That's really, really important if you're using something like MATLAB because it's easy uh, to get results that don't illustrate what your point is uh, simply because MATLAB was quote unquote trying to be helpful. And so here you'll see on line 39 of this pro, uh, program, I say axes uh, from zero to num trial, so the x min, x max, and the y min and the y max, so that the axes stay fixed. And the only thing that changes is your graph, okay? All right, so this is our figure. And this represents a sample size of size 10. So here along the horizontal axis, you see uh, tick marks from zero uh, to 200, right? So that's the 200 trials and each value, each point, um, and these points are connected via a line, didn't have to do it that way, but it's a little bit more visual uh, because it allows you to see uh, the variability a lot more easily. And so here the line represents, the blue line represents the sample um, uh, mean X bar and the red line represents the population mean mu. And as you can see, the population mean mu does not change, right? And if you kind of almost imagine if you were to kind of add up uh, the area under the curve for these spikes that go above the uh, the red line, above the population mean, and these spikes that go below the population mean, it almost looks like it's balanced, right? Um, and that's uh, this variability that I was uh, talking about or alluding to uh, earlier. So here, uh, this is for a sample size of 10. Uh, let me increase the sample size uh, uh, tenfold, an order of magnitude, uh, to 100. And let me change the figure number because I don't want to... Uh, destroy this figure, so I'll call it figure five, and then we'll plot, replot this, uh, or rerun this experiment, and you notice here, uh, here's the first uh, uh, sample size of 10, so that's figure four, and then let me increase figure five size so you can compare uh, how much uh, this sample mean varies when we had an order of magnitude increase uh, in uh, the sample size. So here, Figure four, which is the graph uh, kind of skewed more, you know, on the left-hand side um, of the screen, uh, you'll see that it swings um, up as high as, looks like, let me see, uh, 84.1 as an age, and it can swing as low as um, uh, um, 28, right? Um, and so the average ground truth, the mean ground truth, is 55 and change. So it looks like it's swinging like plus or minus 25, 30 or so, right? Uh, and if we look at figure five, this is what happened when we had a trial, uh, a tr uh, sample size rather, that's an order of magnitude bigger, sample size of 100. And so having a tenfold increase in sample size, you can see uh, a, a very stark difference uh, between the amount uh, uh, that of uh, years that, that sample mean varies for, for average age uh, in the case of a sample size of 10, and then figure five, it's a sample size of 100. And you can see already that um, all things being equal over time, if you keep computing your, your sample mean X bar, uh, that it varies less and less and less, right? Now, certainly we could uh, depict it this way. Uh, we could also, instead of computing um, X bar, we could compute uh, the variance of X bar, right? And so what we do there is here, um, our variance, uh, let me see, let me do that in text. Um, so the sample means, um, oh, oh, there we go, all right. So let's say variance of X bar equals var of the sample means, right? Um, and then, um, so we do that. And let me piggyback, let me move this up. Um, let me move that up. So variance of the sample means, and we had the mean from before. Um, so we said E of X equals blah, display the message. And let me write a separate message, message equals S printf, right? Uh, variance of X bar is equal to floating point, new line, uh, var of X bar. Okay, so I'll also write out, and let me display that message, display message, right? Uh, so in the first case, why is there an error message there? Yeah, I don't care if it's uh, deprecated, I'll still use it. 
Did I misspell something? Can be replaced by a printf. Okay. I guess I have to use a different API at some point soon. All right. Nonetheless, okay. So let's go back to a sample size of 10, right? Let me save that. And of course, the figure called it figure four. So let me set that back uh, to figure four. And we're going to see what the variance was or is. So the variance um, of uh, X bar is 89.9, uh, right? Now remember, standard deviation uh, is the square root of the variance. And the units of variance is uh, is eight is years squared, right? And so, of course, 89.9 years squared doesn't really make sense, right? It's kind of nice to have something that's the same unit as the expected value. And so, we could also plot um, the standard deviation uh, by just taking the square root of the variance, or if MATLAB has an API call uh, for taking standard deviation. But nonetheless, you see the variance is 89 and change uh, for a sample size of 10. And if we change the sample size uh, again to be tenfold, sample size of 100, uh, let me rename the figure so that we can keep uh, the old figure uh, up. And let me run that. So now the variance uh, is now 8.31, right? That's year squared. So by going in that tenfold increase or by uh, using a tenfold increase in sample size, visually we can see that the variance has one setting, and visually we can see when we increase that variance tenfold, as you can see in figure five, the variance uh, decreases dramatically, right? Uh, and so certainly um, we print it out here. You can see variance of X bar in the first case was 89 and change. Variance of X bar in the second case is 8.3, right? So if you had, um, you know, you couldn't afford um, computation for sample size of 100, you try variance for sample size of 10 and 20 and 30, and then eventually you'd see variance drop and decide whether or not uh, for that error tolerance that you're seeing uh, or sample error that you can afford uh, the number of samples it uh, requires. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So this is to show you um, that uh, not only mathematically, let me get rid of MATLAB, uh, this is to show you uh, that these aren't just, you know, cute little theories. Uh, they actually work in practice. And it's really important uh, to visualize and model things uh, to reinforce what you're doing, but also it gets to uh, practice. Uh, you can actually use these things to do interesting things and make interesting statements that you can guarantee uh, are sound. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? So if you have an estimator that you want to substitute for an unknown parameter, uh, you check to see if it's unbiased, you check its consistency, and if it's both unbiased and consistent, uh, then you know it's a good replacement for this unknown ground truth parameter theta. Okay? All right, and we've just demonstrated this with sample mean, uh, and certainly you could do this with all sorts of other uh, estimators uh, or statistics. Okay, any questions about this? That makes sense? Yeah? All right, so uh, let's, uh, well, that's the end of the module. Uh, so we'll uh, continue on with the next module uh, and uh, go forward. You plug in four, you get one divided by zero. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so um, again, the assignment, I wasn't assuming that I would, you know, talk about the same two modules, uh, three and four on the same day. Uh, so again, we have the homework due. Uh, so we just got done saying uh, sample mean, right, talking about sample mean. We talked about the two tests, and um, we showed that the sample mean is unbiased and that the sample mean is also consistent. Right, really important properties. And of course, we uh, mathematically calculated and empirically demonstrated that the sample mean is unbiased. And we just got done uh, with consistency. Uh, we proved it mathematically and we uh, demonstrated it uh, empirically. Okay, so the mean. So the sample mean is unbiased and the sample mean is consistent. So what does this mean about the mean, right? What does that mean? What it means uh, is that the sample mean is fair. Right? That's what this unbiasedness means. On average, right, in expectation, uh, it gives you what it was you were looking for. Right? So uh, we didn't know what the ground truth population parameter was. 
right? Uh, we use the sample mean as a replacement and unbiasedness told us that on average, it's, it's gonna be fair, right? It's gonna give you what you're looking for on average. It might be off the first time you use it. It might be closer the second time you use it. But on average, it's gonna be roughly what you are looking for. Um, it also gets better with experience and that's what uh, consistency uh, talks about or what consistency uh, means. And so as you increase the sample size, uh, think about what it means to increase the sample size. It means that you get more and more and more data, right? You could sort of liken that to having more and more and more experience. And so these two together, it on average, it gives you what you're looking for. It's fair and it gets better with experience. You give it more data and it gets more and more accurate, right? It's less likely to be off by more than a prescribed amount epsilon. Uh, so that means it's a good estimate for the hidden po population mean. Right? If your estimator can pass these two tests, uh, then it is an honest to goodness, great replacement uh, for this unknown quantity. And it's really important, again, I'll note this again, that in the example in MATLAB, um, I showed you what the population mean mu was, ground truth, but you don't have access to that uh, in real life. And you're probably finding that out uh, with your uh, survey assignments. Okay, and so, we talked about this idea of asymptotic normality uh, last semester in um, stochastic when we talked about the so-called central limit theorem. And what that central limit theorem uh, said is that if you have a bunch of measurements and those measurements, you compute a summation or sum over those measurements, uh, if you have enough measurements, then the distribution of that sum looks more and more like a normal distribution. And last semester, we talked about that as a tool uh, for converting uh, a particular uh, distribution to look like a normal distribution so that you could draw comparisons. And so the example that we gave, or one of the examples, let's say you know you were observing customers that come into a coffee shop per window of observation, that's a Poisson distribution. And then let's say you were also um, observing temperature right? Uh, that's a normal distribution. How do you compare the variability of uh, the customers arriving with the temperature? Or maybe you want to find a cross-correlation, look at the coupling between these two different distributions, because certainly if you have a coffee shop, you want to know if, for example, how much does the temperature affect uh, the number of customers I get, right? Uh, why would you care about that? Well, maybe if the temperature's cold, you want to start offering uh, things like soup or whatever, um, other items. Uh, maybe if the temperature is warmer, you want to start offering more uh, uh, cool beverages, right? And so certainly it's conceivable that someone would want to be able to compare two distributions. And we talked about the central limit theorem uh, as this way of getting towards that. Now, how does this relate to the sample mean? Well, if we look at the sample mean, how we calculate the sample mean is we sum together a bunch of measurements, x1, x2, x3, up through and including xn, so we have n many measurements, and we divide by n. Now, certainly dividing by n is the same as multiplying the sum by the scalar 1 over n, right? Uh, so essentially, if we look at the definition uh, for our statistic, our sample mean, um, this x bar, that involves a sum, right? So conceivably, you might think, or one might think, well, if this involves a sum, ah, wait a minute, does this adhere to the central limit theorem? Absolutely it does, right? And so it doesn't matter if you do other stuff to it as long as your statistic contains a sum of measurements, which this certainly does. We have the sum times a scalar, right? Um, we can make use of the central limit theorem, okay? All right, any questions about this? No? All right, so, one of the things we talked about uh, last semester is this idea of the standard normal distribution. So you have some distribution like a Poisson or gamma that's not a normal uh, distribution, right? And you want to compare the two. You can certainly convert them both to a normal distribution, but there was an additional problem, is that the scale of these things uh, might be different. So if you're measuring something, something like age, right, your age will vary in units, like maybe, you know, decade uh, at a time or years, uh, and something like heart rate will vary uh, in a different scale, right? Uh, so how do you compare two normal distributions once you've converted those two distributions to normal distributions? How do you compare them and make fair comparisons? Uh, 
right? Uh, you have to register them, if you will, along the same scale, right? Similar fashion, you know, if somebody explains that, you know, um, some quantity of interest, it was 100 and then it went to uh, 200 uh, or 150 rather, you'd say there was a 50% increase. Now, similarly, if you said something started out at 200 and it uh, increased to 300, you'd also say there's a 50% increase. If you were comparing them in their native form, well, uh, the first example, you say, oh, I got 50 more versus in the other one, I got 100 more, the 100 more is bigger, right? You can't really compare them. But when you convert to this percentage, meaning out of 100, right, you can make a fair comparison between two things whose scale is different. So in similar fashion, the so-called standard normal distribution uh, and the transformation to get you a standard normal distribution uh, does a similar thing that converting something to percentage scale uh, does. And so how you did that is you took advantage of the central limit theorem right, uh, to convert your distribution into a normal, uh, and that's some statistic, and I note it here on the slide as being stat, and then you subtract off from each measurement the expectation of that statistic. So if your statistic were the sample mean, right, um, you would use that in place of what I'm calling stat there. I should have said theta hat. I could similarly have said that, but I want to make it more accessible here to, uh, to drive home the point that this is general. As long as your statistic includes a sum of measurements. You increase those measurements to a suitable number n in that sum of measurements, and you can guarantee that this will look like a normal distribution. Once it looks like a normal distribution, you take each one of your statistics and you subtract off from each of these statistics, the individual ones, the expectation of those statistics, and then you divide that result, those results, uh, by the standard deviation of that statistic. So you take the variance of the statistic and uh, you take the square root of the variance of that statistic. And the result is called the Z distribution uh, or the standard normal distribution. And that standard normal or Z distribution uh, is the scaled down version, kind of like a percent uh, of that normalized um, version of the original uh, distribution. So you start out with a Poisson distribution you uh, increase the sample size to be large enough, it becomes normal. You take the sample mean as your stat, you perform this transformation, the statistic minus its expectation over the standard deviation, uh, that what used to look like a Poisson is now a standard normal distribution. And so here we have an example using X bar. And so in this example we had for the population, uh, we had a bunch of X bars, right? We did that 200 times. And so you take each X bar, you subtract from each X bar the expectation of all the X bars, right? Uh, and then you have a different version of your X bars, right? They're a little bit smaller because you subtracted from each one uh, the expectation of all the X bar uh, statistics. And then you take the variance uh, and divide, um, uh, you take the variance of all the X bars, uh, and then you take the square root of that, right? And that gives you, uh, in the denominator, um, if we recall what the variance was of X bar, it's sigma squared over N. So if we take the square root of sigma squared over N in the denominator, we get sigma over radical N, okay? Any questions about this? So what does this mean? What it means is that for an arbitrary statistic, we can convert its distribution to a normal by taking advantage of the central limit theorem only if that statistic uh, has a sum in it and it becomes more and more like a normal distribution if n gets big enough. Now, you might ask, well, how big does n have to get? It depends on how complicated your original measurement was and the distribution that it comes from, okay? And we can talk about that probably a little bit further into the semester. Uh, it's more of an engineering consideration. Okay, any questions about this? That makes sense? No, yes? Okay. So, of course, this is what it is if we use X bar. It's X bar minus mu because the expectation of X bar is the ground truth parameter uh, because we know that because X bar is both unbiased and it's consistent, right? Uh, and so in a practical experiment, you take your array of X bar measurements and you take the mean of that and that's your substitute for mu. And then the rest uh, you calculate with the variance call, take the square root, or you could use standard deviation directly, okay? So, this term in the denominator of this expression, oftentimes in the literature, 
it'll be called a different name. And the reason why they call it a different name is to distinguish between whether or not your measurement of interest was just a simple measurement or if it was a statistic itself. Sometimes uh, the standard deviation uh, of a statistic is often called standard error, right? Uh, and it's like, why do they do that? Because when you see it, yes, it's a standard deviation, but it's a standard deviation of something that was a statistic, right? And so standard error is a standard deviation or square root of variance of something that was a statistic versus just saying temperature might be the uh, standard deviation of average temperature. Or you could say the local slope in temperature or heart rate or arbitrary statistic. Okay, All right, that makes sense. Any questions about this? And so what I try to do in this class is also uh, give you different terminology because if you go out online or you know look in the research literature, you're going to see all sorts of different names uh, for the same thing. And it all depends on you know what school of thought uh, they had in the institution or place where you uh, first learned it. So different names for lots of things, but standard error is a term that you'll see often, and it's reserved for um, standard deviation of things that were statistics versus just raw measurements. Okay, so let's look at some notation. It's really important uh, to be familiar or familiarize yourself with notation. Uh, when we say mu, mu refers to the population mean, and it's really important uh, to distinguish between notation that pertains to the population quantities or population parameters versus the sample uh, quantities, right? So when we talk about the population mean, which is hidden from you, we use Greek letter symbol mu. Sample mean is X bar, right? Uh, when we talk about uh, the population standard deviation, uh, we say sigma, and sigma is the square root of sigma squared, right? That's for the population governing uh, the population, uh, the, the number or the parameter governing standard deviation of the population. S is called the sample standard deviation, right? Uh, so um, S, uh, you would hope, right? You'd have to do that test for consistency and unbiasedness, uh, you'd hope that S is going to be a good substitute uh, for sigma. And then lastly, uh, sigma squared is the population variance, right? Um, in general, it is unknown, right? But it's certainly there. Uh, it's floating out. You don't have access uh, floating around uh, in the governing the population, and you don't have access to it. And S squared is a sample variance. Now, certainly S is the square root of S squared. Uh, in the same way for the population version of the parameters, which are unknown, um, sigma is the square root of sigma squared. So it's really important to familiarize yourself with the notation. These are pretty standard, and you'll see them both uh, in the Barron textbook for this class, as well as throughout the literature, uh, if you look stuff up, whether it's online or sit in the library and look through various uh, province stats books. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah? No? All right. Yes? Okay, so let's take a look at this next uh, term, uh, median. Now, a lot of times you'll see, especially in things like real estate listings, they'll talk about the median home price. And you might wonder, gosh, well, why, why do they do that? Let's explain first what the median is and talk about its relationship to the mean and why uh, they might use median instead of mean. Right, so mean is nothing more than the sample mean. Okay, we all understand that, and it has certain properties, uh, consistency and unbiasedness, and those two tests uh, guarantee us uh, that the mean, sample mean specifically, is going to be a good replacement for the population mean. Okay, so the sample mean x bar, yes, absolutely, uh, I said it's a good replacement. But when you talk about good replacements, it's often um, important. Uh, to think about this idea of robustness, right? Uh, and so the age range that we gave the sample mean experiment when we did that plot, that age range, right, it was drawn from the range of zero, infancy, uh, through 110. So that didn't vary too much. In the worst case, from one trial to the next, when we talked about 10, uh, 200 trials, uh, we took a sample size of 10. Well, the worst that your measurement can vary is 110 years. Right? Because you could, for one sample, uh, say the age is zero, and then for the very next sample, you say it's 110. But what would have happened if we talked about, you know, instead of the age of a person, maybe the age of a civilization, right? Uh, and we were talking about, you know, uh, maybe, you know, 200 BC uh, through the year 3000 or 2000 BC up to the year 2020, right? In that particular case, 
from one sample to the next, we can get a very big difference uh, between one uh, measurement and the next. And so the sample mean, while absolutely yes, it's a great replacement for the unknown uh, population mean mu, uh, it can be very sensitive to so-called extreme observations or outliers. And so this means when you think about what an age is, right, the average age, that's kind of the middle of your distribution. And of course, some might be a little older, some might be a little bit younger. But every once in a while, you're going to get some measurement that's very different from the typical measurements that you're used to getting, right? Uh, that oddball, if you will, uh, is called an outlier. And that outlier can be either much bigger than what is typical or it can be much smaller than what is typical. But nonetheless, while yes, our sample mean is uh, a good replacement for the population mean, it's not as quote unquote robust as we would like it, right? So let's do a demonstration of that. Okay, so I'm gonna pop out again to MATLAB and I shouldn't have exited MATLAB. Let me bring it back up and I'm gonna reuse some of the MATLAB file uh, that we did before, but I'm just gonna delete a bunch of stuff um, and uh, keep around the population. Okay, so here, we have a bunch of plots, and I don't really care so much about the plots. Oh, let me not delete that. Let me save this. Uh, save as. And let's say test sample mean outlier. Outlier. Um, 2020. Okay, so let's do that. So save that. So I'm going to delete. Uh, the figure stuff. Uh, I'm going to keep some of that text so I don't have to type all the time. Actually, I don't need a bunch of trials either. Um, so let me just, um, let me do this. Let me delete that. Uh, let me uh, delete that. So, all right, let's see. Sample means, I don't need that. Okay, so sample size, I don't need sample size, I don't need trials. So this is a fairly simple demonstration. Okay, so here I have, um, let's call it sample, oh, you know what? Uh, edit, undo. Uh, let me do this. Uh, don't save. I meant to save something that I deleted. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, MATLAB. Or was it? Um, blah, 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 blah. It's alphabetized, so let me go down. Um, let's say JKL. This is slow. Ah, hello. You can see a lot of. Um, oh, why is that so slow? Come on. S T. So now you can see some of the stuff that's in store for you. Oh, there it is. Oh. oh. Test sample mean outlier. So test sample mean um, 2020. Okay, let me do that. Uh, let me resave this. What's the time check? 1021. All right, test sample mean um, outlier 2020. I'm going to overwrite it. Okay, so. Let me not go so fast and <laughs> let me delete the figures and I'm going to keep that one. So trials, I don't need trials, but I do need to select uh, a sample, right? So I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, so we're not talking about sample mean, we're talking about mean, right? Um, sample mean. Okay. So many, yeah. So let's do that. Um, yeah, I'll do that. So let me. I don't want to use mu. All right. So let's uh, get a bunch of samples. Uh, and I'm only gonna take uh one sample. So the samples. I don't need the sample means. All right. So. I don't need trials either. Okay, so we have our original population from before. 
uh, of ages between 0 and 110. And we have a sample size. And the sample size is going to be, let's just say, set it to 20. So we're going to pull 20 individuals from the population based on their index. And so here, uh, I create random integer. Right, and that's going to select uh, my samples, and the samples are the set of samples that I take uh, from this population. So here's sample mean uh, from those samples, and I'm going to take this uh, array of the samples, and I'm going to say the out, the outlier samples. So I'm going to take a version of the samples, call it the outlier samples, and what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to uh, make a copy of the samples and call it the outlier samples, but I'm going to replace one of these samples with a value that is very different from all the others, so much, much bigger than 110, right? Uh, so let me try that. So the outlier samples is equal to, um, so let me just say sample mean is here, because I want to compute the mean before I modify the outlier samples is going to be the samples, right? And I'm going to say the outlier samples. I'm going to take the last one, one comma sample size, so that last one. So if I take 20 samples, it's going to be that 20th sample, and I'm going to change its value to something big, right? So the age range was originally from 0 to 110 when I took the samples. And whatever that last sample is, I'm just going to change it to be um, let's say 500, right? Okay, so I do that, and what this is doing is I'm just adding or replacing one of the samples that I took with something that's not typical, very different from all the others. It's an oddball, if, as it were. And so what I'm going to do is show you that out of these 20 samples, if one of them is an oddball, we'll see how that changes the value of the sample mean. Does that make sense? Okay, and I'm trying to reuse code and talk at the same time. Um, as you can probably guess, I don't multitask very well. All right, so let's um, print some things out. So we'll say, uh, we'll print out the sample mean and we'll print out the outlier version of the sample mean. So I'll say the, uh, let's say outlier, outlier sample mean is just the mean of the outlier samples, okay? So we're going to compute the, uh, the, 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 the sample mean right, uh, from our sample, and then we're going to um, modify it by adding an oddball, by replacing one of those samples with an oddball that's much different from all the others, right, with 500. And then we're going to just print out the original sample mean and the outlier version of the sample mean. Okay, so, um, so let's do this. So we're going to print two messages. One is x bar, x, x bar, our sample mean. So that's going to be sample mean, sample mean. And then the other message, message two, is going to be, uh, we'll call it x, x bar outlier, uh, x bar out for outlier, percent f backslash n. And we'll give it um, outlier sample mean. Okay, so we'll display message zero, and we'll display message two, and we'll show you the impact of uh, replacing one of the, the samples with that uh, oddball. So here, okay, so the original sample mean was 54, right? Um, in the second case, we took that last sample out of the 20 and replaced it with that oddball, and we see that it moved. It moved from 54, it jumped like a whole 20 and change uh, years, right? Um, let's see what happens if we make the outlier smaller, right? Now, of course, I know you can't have negative age, but, you know, we're using age, so I'm going to make something smaller. The only way I can make something smaller is by saying negative, right? Uh, so humor me. So if I made the outlier smaller from below, like negative 50, right? Um, okay. Uh, so let's see what happens. So I print that out. All of a sudden, instead of 54 and change, 
uh, it's now 48 and change, right? So it jumped down like almost six or a little bit more than six. Oh yeah, about six uh, years. And so what does this mean? So what this means is that um, if you have a sample and you're trying to use X bar as a sample mean as a good replacement, that the amount by which your sample could vary might dramatically impact the value of your sample mean, giving you a very incorrect um, replacement or estimator for that unknown population. And so here um, in the first case, uh, we had um, 20 samples and we just replaced one of them or with something that's an oddball, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, now there's a big difference between 54 and change and 76 and change. And remember that when we looked at the original array, um, the original uh, ground truth mu was 55 and change, right? And so um, originally our X bar was going to get us very close in the ballpark of the un unknown parameter, but because you had this weird 500 that's oddball that appeared uh, among the samples in the sample mean, it moved that result pretty dramatically, right? And so that oddball is called an outlier. And the sample mean has this problem uh, that when you add an oddball or an outlier, it can dramatically change the result. Now, if you're relying on X bar to be your replacement for this unknown thing, that's pretty bad when one little oddball added to the mix uh, can damage greatly its uh, ability to represent the unknown ground truth parameter, right? And so this idea of your ability to either remain fixed or you change a lot in the presence of an outlier right, is called robustness, right? And so, yes, absolutely, we said the sample mean is unbiased and it's consistent, but it has this flaw in that it is brittle uh, to so-called outliers. Does that make sense? So that's a really important uh, thing to think about because what happens when you get outliers? Well, the cause of outliers could be something called noise, right? You could have just some flaw, right? So um, if you've ever seen these um, pulse oximeters, there's these things you can put on your finger uh, tip and it's used to measure oxygen saturation, right? Uh, air exchange uh, um, for the lung blood barrier. And when you first put this sensor on your finger, right, before it's a snug, nice, tight fitting contact, it's going to give you bad values, right? And so those are outliers. So let's say, you know, um, you have a camera and you're measuring some, you know, colors of things or motion or what have you. You plug in the camera or maybe there's some electrical interference and all of a sudden you get a weird picture, right? Uh, that weird picture that is not typical of normal pictures, that's an outlier. So your outlier could be that some oddball comes along or it could be due to some noise or external influence uh, in the measurements uh, that you're taking. And so there's a problem with that, right? Um, you don't want that to change your idea of uh, this uh, replacement, as it were, uh, for the ground truth uh, unknown population parameter. Real estate. Um, when you uh, look at real estate, one of the measures in terms of cost of living and stuff like that, that they have for various zip codes and locales is how typical uh, is a home price in this area. Now, of course, you know, you could have home prices that are like two in this area um, that are like 200, 300,000, but somebody comes along and buys or builds a house that's like $2 million, wonderful for him or her. But the problem is if a typical measurement for home price in the area is about 200,000 to 250,000, for example, someone comes along and builds a wonderful house for $2 million, all of a sudden that $2 million house is gonna skew or pull what your understanding is of what the average is, right? And so for that reason, people use a different statistic uh, called the median, okay? That makes sense? So you, if you look on Zillow.com, you'll see the median home price and you don't see the mean home price because you can have that come along. You can have an outlier, whether it's an outlier on the high end or an outlier on the low end, uh, skew or change your understanding um, incorrectly of what is typical, okay? And so um, an estimator whose value changes dramatically when, you, when new data arrives uh, can't be terribly reliable. And so this idea of when new data arrives, uh, if that new data point or new measurement 
is an oddball or not typical, i.e. an outlier. So that's where the median comes in. The median is a more so-called robust statistic, meaning that if things change dramatically, the median does not change as much uh, as the mean. Uh, the median uses what are called order statistics, and we'll get into that uh, more next time. Uh, but let's just look at a very high level view. So the median uh, uses what's called the middle value. Right, or the middle order statistic. It's called an order statistic because you take all your measurements and you order them in some fashion. It could be in non-decreasing order or it could be in non-increasing order. Now I say non-decreasing order instead of increase for a specific reason. When you talk about a bunch of values, let's say I have the value one, um, two, uh, seven, 15. That's increasing order, right? And everyone understands that. But when you say increasing order, you don't account for the fact that two measurements can be exactly the same, right? So if I had another set of measurements, one, two, two, seven, fifteen, right? That's called non-decreasing. Non-decreasing, right, means that it can either stay the same or get bigger, but it will never decrease. Conversely, there's something called non-increasing. That would be fifteen. 7, 2, 2, 1. Non-increasing says that it can either decrease or stay the same. So typically in mathematics or statistics, I should say more correctly, um, you'll see the term non-increasing and non-decreasing. That's not an accident. That's on purpose. Because it, these measurements are independent from one another, and so you could certainly have two measurements in your set of measurements that have exactly the same value. Okay? So, when we talk about order statistic, an order statistic is nothing more than some sorted order uh, of your measurements, be that non-increasing, non-decreasing, or something called lexicographic, you know, using the rules of language uh, to look at alphabetic, alphanumeric ordering. So, you use the middle value in some ordering instead of the balance point of the probability mass, and that's what the mean was, and we talked about that last semester. And the beauty of the median is that it's a measure for what is typical, right? Because it's representing its position among all the different measurements, uh, but it doesn't change much when new data arrives. And so one of the depictions of that, let's just take this same list. We, let's take this middle list here, one, two, two, seven, fifteen. Now, if I added an extreme outlier on this side, negative 100, well, if uh, the middle order statistic uh, was here, right, between 2 and 7, it would move it one, uh, one um, measurement in this sorted list, right? So the value in this case goes from 2 to 2, right? doesn't change. If I took my outlier and I put my extreme outlier on this side, let's say 100 over here, it's much bigger than these numbers, well, it doesn't change more than from 2 to 7, right? And so this idea of the median as being a more robust statistic uh, that the value of interest does not change much when new data arrives, right? And median is uh, one of those robust statistics. And it's used to measure uh, what is typical and it's more robust uh, than the mean. And so you might ask yourself, well, when do I use the median? It all depends on how noisy your data is, how wildly your data varies. And so in real estate, because you can have such a wide swing, of housing prices. You can go to any locale in the country, regardless of how high the cost of living is. Well, it's obvious you'll have a million, $2 million home. Or how low the cost of living is. You'll always find a million or multi-million dollar home just about everywhere in the country. And so because of the uh, wide swath over which those values will vary in the real estate industry, what is typical when they report the typical home price for a location, they'll often report the median home price. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, so this is the so-called sample median, and I'll end with this and pick back up with this because uh, I don't want to break this module uh, too much um, unnaturally. Uh, the sample median is marked as M hat, right? Now we just got say, uh, done saying from before, and I said it a couple times so far, uh, that when you say hat, that is the estimator. It's used to stand in place. So here we have the sample median, 
So it's a statistic, it's computed over samples, and this m hat is a good replacement for the so-called population median, right? And there's a definition for the population median we'll talk about next time. So what is the sample median m hat? It's exceeded by most at by at most half the observations. So that means that no more than half the observations, your measurements, are bigger than m hat, right? Uh, and it's also preceded by at most half the observations. So you also see in the literature this term, the middle order statistic, right? It's the order statistic, i.e. the function, that gives you the middle element in some sorted order, right? And so here in this example, we have a list of samples, and their values are 1, 4, 7, 9, 11 in non-decreasing order. Now, if you look at the middle order statistic, okay, well, we have um, one to five of them, and seven is the middle order statistic or the sample median. So no more than half. So here we have five of them. Half of them would be uh, 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 two and a half, and you can't split up a measurement. So that's why the no more than uh, uh, notation is there or terminology is there. So if we have five of them, no more than half, well, no more than two and a half, we can't really say two and a half, so that means two, right, two or less. So here, two of them, nine and 11, are bigger than or exceed seven, and no more than half, and at most half, um, are smaller, right, preceded. So half, that's no more than two, so that's one and four, that's two of them that proceed. So seven is the sample median uh, m hat. So this is what happens if you have an odd number, but what happens if you have an even number? Okay, well, in essence, when you have an even number of measurements, it's almost like you have two middle points, right? Uh, because if it's even, well, you can divide them into two equal groups. So what do you do? You take the first middle point, you take the second middle point, and you compute the middle between those two quote-unquote middles, right? So here we have a list of four items. Four is an even number. Uh, their values are one, four, seven, and nine. So we take the 4 and the 7, and we take the midpoint between the two. 4 plus 7 over 2 is 5.5. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions? Uh, so for the sample median, it's a statistic. It's based on the ordering. And we have the two cases when we have an odd number of measurements and we have an even number of measurements. For the odd number, you just calculate the middle order statistic. Uh, using this at most uh, criterion, uh, for an even number, you synthesize the middle order statistic. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, so it is 10.40. Uh, I will end there, and we'll pick back up uh, with the balance of this on uh, Thursday. I'll see you Thursday.